Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today for the first um, legal lunch and learn of the year, lobbying versus advocacy. We're very excited to have you all with us. Um, before I pass this over to our fearless leader, Martha Rands, I wanna take a few moments to just do some basic housekeeping. Um, we are gonna be la launching some polls. I'll launch one right now. We do ask that you take a moment to um, complete those when you get a chance. Uh, the answers to those as well as some of the questions that are going to be coming will be used to sort of help inform further movement around this issue. Um, on that note, please make sure you post any questions for any of the panelists directly into the Q&A section. They'll be reviewed and um, we'll get to those questions at the end of the session. Uh, if you're new to PLEO, welcome. Um, PLEO hosts a number of different events, resources, and we provide legal aid to nonprofits and artists across BC and the Yukon. Um, if you are new to us, then I encourage you to take a moment after the event to have a look at our website, review some of the resources, and feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, finally, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that PLEO is joining you today from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, in particular the Musqueam, Squamish, and Selwatif people. Um, so we thank them for or their forbearance, as Mother Anne likes to say. Um, that's all for me. Welcome once again. And now I'm going to be passing it over to our wonderful panelists. Um, for more details on each of their backgrounds, have a look at the chat. I'm about to post everyone's bios. And uh, welcome. Great. Thanks so much, Martha. Um, these days, in order to be a member of the team, you have to be named Martha. So we're actively <laughs> collecting Marthas just to confuse everybody. Um, Thanks so much everyone for joining us today. Uh, some of you know that this is um, a, a really hot button issue and one that we, we addressed when the LTA, the Lobbyist Transparency Act was um, introduced last year. And we had a whole host of organizations participating in our conversation at the time. Since then, um, I've taken it upon myself to, to write a little op-ed or letter to the editor in response to a piece that John Lawrence uh, wrote for The Philanthropist about the importance of lobbying for the nonprofit sector, for the charitable and nonprofit sector. And my concerns, which were primarily around conflating the term lobbying with advocacy. And so today, uh, John is going to moderate a conversation with us um, where I'm going to provide my view. Um, Sheree Payne is, the, is uh, here from Vantage Point and uh, she was part of a participant in the production of the brief that uh, was co-written with Vancouver Foundation, the United Way and Board Voice. Joining us today, Sarah Kim from the Vancouver Foundation, and we will have, I hope, what is a spirited conversation. So take it away, John. Okay, thanks very much, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, um, virtually with all of you, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. So uh, just uh, a little bit about where I'm coming from. I So I, I report on all sorts of things, but I've done a lot of reporting about politics and government, and so lobbying and advocacy come up all the time um, in, you know, I do a lot of reporting on municipal government and the, you know, the lines between lobbyists and, you know, sort of, sort of public minded groups can be kind of fuzzy. Um, and there have been efforts over the years to sort of make those definitions more crisp for the purposes of registering lobbyists, for the purposes of understanding, you know, who's talking to whom and about what, um, so more recently, I did a little bit of reporting for the philanthropist on the uh, on how the political activities rule in the, uh, in the Income Tax Act had been changed as a result of you know mounting pressures and ultimately a couple of court cases, um, and that was that change in in political activities was. Uh, you know, a lot of people were saying, thinking to themselves, a lot of people in the sector were thinking that this might change the way the sector and the participants in the sector express themselves to government. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a, this is a slow process. This will uh, change incrementally over time. Um, I think what, uh, you know, when Martha and I had our exchange uh, in the philanthropist, it was apropos the, um, the urgency that was posed by the pandemic and the, the way that different 
organizations, different industries were speaking to government in order to cause government to address their specific problems. And um, in some cases, that advocacy and that lobbying was very successful and produced, you know, quite you know, remarkable results, or, you know, if you think back to the spring of 2020, and in other cases, it was less successful. And so, uh, so I wrote a, I wrote a column for the philanthropist thinking about, you know, whether the, um, the not-for-profit and the charitable sector could draw on the techniques of, uh, of professional lobbyists uh, lobbying for, you know, sort of for-profit organizations. And Martha uh, uh, rebutted uh, the argument talking about the importance of distinguishing between uh, lobbying as an activity to advance private interests and advocacy as an activity to uh, cause policymakers to think about public it matters of public interest. So I'm going to stop talking there and I'm going to give it over to the three panelists and we're going to try to sort of breathe some life into the um, into this discussion and hopefully have an exchange of views and at the end we'll take uh, questions. So I'm going to begin with Sherry and uh, have her talk about you know how these issues are playing in uh, BC at the moment, um, especially in light of the uh, this new legislation that's been tabled. So I'm going to leave it over to you. Thank you. Well, hello everyone and thank you for the opportunity for joining the discussion today, Plio. Um, advocacy for public interest organizations is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. I spent 20 years or so as an advisor on government relations, advocacy and communications campaigns after law school. I was a consultant actually with a multinational lobby firm working in both their Vancouver and Ottawa offices. And I was a political staffer to a federal minister of health. I crafted advocacy campaigns for health, not for profit, public interest and professional association organizations here in BC and in cities across the country. Um, as background, I did my undergrad at McGill in Montreal and my law degree at Osgoode Hall in Toronto. So I've seen a lot of different organizations try to influence policymakers and funding decisions over the years. And I've worked with organizations with both a lot of resources and organizations with very little. And the reason I was glad Martha invited me to this panel today is that I often get quite fired up when I see organizations that have few resources, but a lot of expertise, take a back seat at the table and cede advocacy efforts to organizations that might have a lot of money, but not the broad public impact perspective that not-for-profits have. So now that I'm Director of Government Relations and Sector Development with Vantage Point, I'm so passionate to have the chance to talk with our members about what is possible with advocacy and working with government to enact change. So some of you might know that Vantage Point is a not-for-profit leadership organization that provides training, workshops, governance consulting, and advocacy support to other not-for-profits. We represent over 500 members across 68 communities in BC, and each year we reach not-for-profit leaders across the province through our training and capacity building services. One of our goals as we work to strengthen the sector is partnering with stakeholders to share ideas and knowledge to help build community. So this, this discussion today is really vital to our work as an organization. Over the last year, Vantage Point surveyed over a thousand individuals for an assessment of how COVID-19 has impacted the sector and to identify its needs for recovery. And what we heard is that after the wildfires, the floods, and two years of pandemic, many of our member organizations have been close to burnout. They've been stretched thin, and with the administrative burden that comes with the Lobbyist Transparency Act, many have simply decided it's not worth the effort to engage with government at all. They've determined that they'd rather focus their energy on serving clients and their communities. This is a huge loss for the province because it's not-for-profit organizations who are seeing firsthand what is happening on the ground and have the knowledge and expertise that decision makers need to take good decisions about how to move the province forward. So I know Sarah Kim at uh, the Vancouver Foundation is gonna walk us through some of the options that we have to make the work of sharing ideas with government and proposing solutions to them um, less onerous. And I know Martha has some ideas about why not-for-profits uh, shouldn't be tasked with the administrative burden at all. So I'll come back to the opportunities that we have as not-for-profit organizations to raise awareness about important issues to policymakers and to funders. Our expertise is really vital in the discussions about how the province should direct social infrastructure support here in BC. And we're really all here to help make people's lives easier, more joyful, and to help build communities that thrive. So I'm really looking forward to your feedback and the discussions from the rest of the panel. I'll hand the mic back to you, John. 
thanks very much. Uh, that was a, a great uh, setup. So I'm going to hand it over to Martha, who's going to um, share her perspective on on the the distinctions and why they're important. Well, this is a difficult question to answer because technically, that while there may be different um, dictionary definitions of what lobbying is and what advocacy is, that they aren't necessarily very helpful when you're trying to sort out whether or not you should be um, registering uh, as a lobbyist. Um, my, my view is this, the, the view that I take is that lobbying really references personal benefits to the individuals and entities that are doing the lobbying. And by personal, I, I, would, I would say financial um, benefits that can be traced to individuals. So in the case of advocating for, I don't know, increasing um, oil sands production in light of what's happening uh, in the world, then the people who would benefit from that are the shareholders of the corporation. And in the nonprofit context, we are not shareholders. We are members of a society. We're members of a charity. And we do not personally benefit from the activities of the charity, the, particularly charities. Charities are already operating in the public benefit. So the public impact, I like those words a lot, public interest is at the core of charities. It's also at the core of most, not all, but most nonprofits and not-for-profits in the country. And as a consequence, I think we're conflating what they do with the lobbying that goes on in, in the corporate sector, for lack of a better way of framing it, um, that gener genuinely does um, support the bottom line, not only of the company, but also of the shareholders individually. And so I kind of bristle at the idea of calling myself a lobbyist. Our organization is very small. Uh, Strictly speaking, the advocacy I do is for the benefit of the sector, raising legal issues, raising uh, possible reform to laws like the, like the Lobbyist Transparency Act. It is not to increase my salary or, uh, or anything else. Um, and in fact, I think it, it's dangerous to conflate, you know, the fact that an organization's executive director is meeting with government with the conflate that with individuals um, who are meeting with government with a specific agenda that that engages personal benefits. Um, so that's why I responded quite viscerally to uh, John's point. Uh, while I agree, it's really important that the sector be advocates for our communities and for all the needs of our communities. I don't think calling them lobbyists or the Lobbyist Transparency Act is the way to go. And in many provinces um, and other jurisdictions, there is an exemption for charities and nonprofits for that very reason. Now, there is a caveat with the, with the exception, which is that member-based organizations that are uh, advocating for their members, i.e. the Petroleum Producers Association, which are primarily for-profit companies, are uh, required to still um, register as lobbyists. And indeed, trade unions as well, and there are some other obvious examples. And I think that's fine. Um, but that's a really small subset of the 29,000 plus uh, nonprofits and societies in BC alone. Thank you, Martha. So 
Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sarah, um, who's going to speak on behalf of um, the Vancouver Foundation, and uh, you'd like to offer your perspective on this discussion. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me here. I appreciate uh, the invitation from Martha times two. Um, I also noticed some familiar names in, uh, uh, with attendees, so it's great to, to see some uh, faces and names here. And also thanks for completing the poll because I, I found that very helpful to know um, why folks are here and, and also um, your understandings of the Lobbyist Transparency Act here in BC. Um, I'm gonna be speaking more about that Lobbyist Transparency Act and, and um, from the perspective of Vancouver Foundation and actually what um, we with uh, a few partners in the sector have been doing around um, the, the barriers that the Lobbyist Transparency Act um, offers to, to uh, and challenges um, for nonprofits and charities here in BC. So Vancouver Foundation has been doing, um, in the past sev several years, has been doing um, pre-budget consultations and outreach with many organizations in the sector. And one of the things that we um, have been hearing repeatedly are the barriers that organizations are facing when it comes to engaging with government on important issues that their communities are facing. We connected with a few other um, larger uh, umbrella organizations with memberships, including Board Voice and United Way BC and Vantage Point. And they too shared that they were hearing very similar challenges from their memberships too. At Vancouver Foundation, we have been exploring how we can use our influence, resources, and connections to enable organizations to do what they do best. And so last fall, we came together with Board Voice, United Way BC, and Vantage Point, and started to strategize on how we could advocate or lobby together for changes to the Lobbyist Transparency Act. <coughs> and we ended up uh, meeting on a weekly basis to continue those conversations and to, to strategize on what we could do together. Late last fall in late November, um, you may remember that Parliamentary Secretary Nikki Sharma received an updated mandate letter. And we were pleased to see that in addition to that mandate letter, um, was, was an initiative to work with the Attorney General to help clarify obligations for the non, for nonprofit organizations under the Lobbyist Transparency Act. So through those weekly meetings, the four partners drafted a brief document to submit to government. And in that briefing document, which I'm going to share a link to you um, shortly, so you can see it also. In that document are case studies of organizations who have faced challenges and, and how those challenges are impacting their work. And there are some recommendations listed, including a priority action of a comprehensive review of the Lobbyist Transparency Act. I think it's important to note that we are the charitable sector and nonprofit sector is actually not the only sector who's being impacted by the Lobbyist Transparency Act. And that we actually have allies in other sectors who are also working towards um, changes for this act, including the business sector, chambers of commerce and boards of trade. So there is multi-sector momentum happening around changes to the Lobbyist Transparency Act. And so a couple of weeks ago, the four partners formally submitted our Lobbyist Transparency Act brief to the Attorney General and the Office of the Registrar of Lobbyists. And currently we're, we are awaiting their response. So I'm just going to uh, drop the link to the brief so that you can take a look at it. And I will pass it back to John. Okay, um, thank you. That was very interesting. Uh, so I'd like to, uh, so, uh, uh, we're going to do a couple of rounds of questions, and uh, and then we'll take some questions from the floor. So, um, uh, so this is the first question that I have, um, and it has to do with the the relationship between an organization's culture um, and its ability to advocate. Um, so the the political activities rule um, that was long standing was overturned by a very small um, anti poverty group in Ottawa. That had very few resources, and um, you know, managed to get a Supreme Court decision that altered the Income Tax Act, and so they had a culture of very kind of 
you know, assertive advocacy in this in this small organization. You all know large organizations that are much more cautious. Uh, and so I'm wondering if um, so. So here's the question I have: Is is there anything about lobbying in the way that it's done in the private sector? Are there techniques that um, that the not-for-profit sector should be thinking about in terms of how it, you know, how, you know how it advocates for the interests of the different organizations? So, uh, Shuri, let's start with you. Sure. I think you know you touched on a good point in terms of there being a continuum of activity. And at one end of the spectrum, there is activism. Um, and at, at the other end of the spectrum, there's maybe more sort of pure cautious lobbying. And I think uh, that middle point that we're talking about today is in fact, organizations that have identified a problem and we are seeking to make change through government. So we have a specific ask. There's something concrete that we want government to do, whether a policy or regulation or to provide funding. So in that sense, it is actually lobbying. There's something concrete we need the government to do. Um, and so there are techniques that uh, pure private sector lobbyists use that the not-for-profit sector could also be adopting in terms of um, identifying who the influencers to shape the decision are, telling the story of why the issue is important, um, seeking win-wins. What, what are the kinds of things that the decision makers are pressured by? What will help Make, the, make it easier for them to say yes to what we're doing. So these are the sort of uh, tactics that lobbyists use, which is different than activism, where maybe you're ahead of government and you're, you've identified a problem others are not yet aware of, and you're really pushing for public awareness even to recognize that the problem exists. Is there an example that comes to mind do, that sort of illustrates your point? Um, well, I think, for example, a classic example of the, the pharmaceutical industry, where they are, you know, very business focused, and they are specifically trying to get certain drugs funded or to make it easier for their sector to operate, which is different than maybe if we think back to the 80s or 90s when we had a group like ACT UP um, uh, adv doing advocacy around recognizing the impact of the HIV/AIDS. Right. pandemic at that time. So they're at different ends of the spectrum because there's different awareness and different levels of buy-in to the problem that they're trying to address. Yeah. Martha, what would you say about this question about about the well, you know, yeah I you know I, I don't have the experience that um, Sherry does Sherry, sorry now I'm gonna do the wrong thing um, that I you know I'm a lawyer. Um, and I look at the Lobbyist Transparency Act and my response to the query in part is, well, if you're less than six employees and 50 hours um, in a 12 month period, then you're exempt from the Lobbyist Transparency Act. Also, if you're lobbying uh, or if your advocacy, such as letters, uh, campaigns are authored by your volunteer directors, um, then they are not lobbyists within the meaning of the Lobbyist Transparency Act. Um, so there are ways for small organizations to get engaged without the, the burdens, um, particularly the burdens that are described in the brief um, of the various big organizations that are having to, um, or feel they have to uh, register a whole bunch of folks, not just you know, the executive director or the director of uh, law reform at the organization. I think most of the staff of the BC Civil Liberties Association are in fact registered lobbyists, which seems insane to me, um, not only because of the registration burden, but because, you know, I don't think that the majority of what they're advocating for is for the benefit of that organization. It's for the benefit of the society. It's for the benefit of the community. Um, they are advocating for us to change our views towards stigmatization of various communities. Um, not, and that to me is a fundamentally different thing than lobbying for uh, a government purse to be opened in a particular way. And maybe there's a, an exemption, maybe there's the distinction that I, I might make. Um, but even then I'm like, and we get a grant to do what? We get a grant to provide legal services 
to the nonprofit sector. That's what we get when we advocate for the needs of uh, nonprofits to have access to legal advice. And I just don't see this as um, as lobbying now, you know, uh, and we should be using the tactics of lobbyists in the sense that they're organized, they're um, consistent in their messaging, they're um, working together often, they're very effective. And there are um, umbrella organizations in the nonprofit sector that do pursue um, very successful advocacy, as we've seen with um, the disability community primarily, um, has managed to, you know, Al Mansky, who I met, you know, over 20 years ago, has managed, has changed how disabled people experience the world as a consequence of his advocacy. I don't think he's a lobbyist. Um, I just don't. So, um, there you go. I may not really have answered your question about tactics, but you know, I'm not the tactician. Maybe Sarah, you might have some more tactical ideas. Um, well, I don't know if I have as many strategies as Cherie, who is the professional lobbyist or was a professional lobbyist in a previous career does. Um, but I would like to speak on some of the recommendations that we included in our brief, um, because they do relate to um, the impacts that the Lobbyist Transparency Act has on smaller not-for-profit and charities that wouldn't impact for-profit larger corporations. I, I find it really interesting on the Office of the uh, Register of Lobbyists website, they post monthly reports on, and, and the report is called Who's Lobbying Who? So you can actually see who is lobbying which ministries, which elected officials. And when I look through it, that list, it's all larger corporations like TELUS or um, Uber, and they've hired cons lobbying consultants to do that work for them. You never see any smaller not-for-profits, um, charities on that list. And, and so you have to wonder, why is that? And, and from what we've heard, it's because the, the administrative burdens, the um, lack of clarity between what constitutes lobbying versus advocacy um, is is creating a chilling effect. People, organizations are now just not even engaging with government because either um, they don't know if it's lobbying or, or advocacy or they're being penalized by the ORL, the Office of the Register of Lobbyists for, um, for either registering something that is not considered lobbying or even just for asking the office questions like for clarification. We met with this elected official, is this considered lobbying? And, and then there's all this back and forth. There's just a lack of clarity or consistency around the Lobbyist Transparency Act. So in this brief, the recommendations we offer, some of them are around either reducing the amount of reporting or removing particular reporting activities. Um, and, and one of the recommendations that, um, that I'd like to emphasize is for the Attorney General and the Office of the Register of Lobbyists for them to actually work with the nonprofit sector in updating their guidance for nonprofit um, organizations document. And so in working together on updating that document, that document will contain language that our sector will understand. And ideally, um, uh, some of the changes to the Lobbyist Transparency Act. I think that currently right now, as Martha has been saying, the Lobbyist Transparency Act seems to be directed to for-profit organizations and not necessarily to the nonprofit sector. So again, if the ORL is able to, to work with us in, in creating these changes, I think it will make it much easier. Well, that's the goal and the outcome we're looking for is to make it easier for the charitable sector to to engage with government, which at this point in time, you know, we're two years into the pandemic. And then after last year with all of the, the um, climate disasters we've encountered, um, the charitable sector and nonprofit sector is so vital right now in, in creating the changes that we need to see in community and our voices are not being heard. Let me ask all three of you this question. Um, so three or four years ago, we had this process where the Income Tax Act was revised and the 10% rule 
on political activities was removed. Um, and uh, I remember when I did a story on this for the philanthropist, somebody said to me, uh, you know, nobody's going to notice that uh, and it's not going to change anything. Um, in your work with your various clients um, and your observations about how they're responding to these, these, you know, this regulatory framework that's being advanced in BC or elsewhere, do you think that that the recognition of this shift has kind of percolated down um, so that people feel less chilled about advocacy? I should I should add that in behind the door behind me is the director of communications for the Pemina Institute. And so, uh, you know, which was, you know, in the crosshairs of a lot of governments for doing something that was supposed to be doing and being called something else. So I like, I feel like I have like ringside seats to this conversation. So what do you think, Martha? Yeah, well, um, yeah, I, I absolutely the change is, has percolated down. I think that, um, you know, as a lawyer in private practice, I've um, worked with a number of public policy organizations over the last year, specifically to get them charitable status, um, because um, the uh, elimination of that um, gave usually their board comfort that they could now apply. And the guidance has, has expanded our understanding of the word policy to enable um, these groups to more confidently um, apply. The problem, though, is that, you know, there's, there's a, there's an ongoing, you know, but what about if another Stephen Harper comes in, what are we going to do? <laughs> because a, some of this is very subjective, right? Like, there are people in this space who want to be lobbyists, they, they feel that in order to be that, you know, power broker, they need to do that. And so th there's, there's that culture as well. Um, and, you know, I think the fear is, you know, some, some have said, you know, if I'm registered as a lobbyist, I'm gonna be seen in the same light as others. And our goal is public policy development, not, not lobbying, not, not the kind of things that, um, some uh, corporate entities are getting engaged in. And we're really concerned, given the past with political activities, that we are going to get, get into trouble. And, you know, sadly, that, that trouble is not unwarranted. The CRA, God love them, um, sometimes says one thing and sometimes says another. It's it depends a lot on who's looking. And, you know, I, I too have spoken to people at the uh, office of the registrar of lobbyists and they absolutely are mean well. <laughs> and there's just a limit to how much nuance they can really get their heads around ultimately kind of which is where why we have this chilling effect because nuance really matters. And I think the easiest way to deal with this from a regulatory point of view is to exempt charities and nonprofits with the caveat that those that are membership based may be treated differently and, um, and let us decide if what we're doing warrants uh, further consideration, you know? Um, and you know, one of the questions in the chat is, how do we know what is 50 hours? You know, how do we know? Do people even understand that six employees doesn't mean six contractors? It means six staff, it means people who are employees within the meaning of the Employment Standards Act. So if you're all, if you're three part-time contractors and really like if you added it all up you're definitely not doing 50 hours in a year then why would you register and that message needs to get out because you know there's a lot of organizations that are exactly that and they're in small communities and they ought to be able to meet with their local mla without causing a big kerfuffle 
Sherry, what do you think about this? Uh, yeah, I'm really, I, I'm really um, sort of fascinated to hear Martha's experience and what kinds of advice clients are asking her now that the change is there and how it's impacting the way they think about applying for charitable status. Um, something that struck me in the discussion so far is this idea of small organizations having a, a different culture, you know, maybe you're signing up volunteers to engage in the advocacy work or in the political influencing work. Um, and what struck me was that um, that is true of the way a lot of not-for-profit organizations operate. And we're seeing some larger corporations adopting those same tactics because the optics of it are in fact better. It does sound um, like you're working in the public interest when you have volunteers and you're thinking about the broad policy perspective. So um, we see, just as we're trying to, to learn what are the tactics these bigger organizations use that are effective, they're in fact kind of muddying the waters by creating fake grassroots campaigns, pretending that they have um, you know, volunteers and a big momentum within the community. And so there's this blurring of the line between both, both large and small organizations um, that is confusing to government decision makers. And I'm always struck by what I heard from one cabinet minister I was sitting down with and we presented you know, some concerns we were seeing and some proposed solutions. And the minister said, um, oh, you know, it's so interesting to hear your perspective because I meet with professional lobbyists all day long and they all have a similar approach to structuring a meeting. And uh, therefore, the decision maker starts to think the same way as the lobbyists and they start to feel as though that is the way work gets done. So when we come in with a different style and a different culture, it's jarring. And in some ways it's kind of inefficient for the decision makers day. So speaking of nuance, these are just a lot of the ideas that were coming into my head as we had the conversation about the nuance and the trickiness of cutting through culture to make our positions known. Thank you. Um, Sarah, what's your uh, what's your view on this? Yeah, to be honest, I I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I I'm not sure of the impact of how those changes um, have had affected organizations at that time. But what I do know um, currently is that um, we we've done um, some research and data, and we know that there is a decline in reporting for not-for-profits in BC in this past year. But what's interesting is that the ORL reports that they've received an increase in not reporting, but in inquiries to the office. And so I I don't know if they're if they're calculating or making that connection that an increase in inquiries means an increase in lobbying activity being registered and reported, but that's absolutely not what we're seeing at all. We know that lobbying has gone down, and even though the ORL thinks that, it actually has gone up. Okay, I, um, I'm going to take some questions from the, the chat. Um, I'll just throw them out, and, uh, and then uh, uh, you can pick them up. So uh, let's see here. Um, here's one from Sam Dixon. Does the amount of time and money spent on lobbying affect whether the small not-for-profits qualify for reporting? Well, the lawyer will say yes. Um, the amount of time, yes. The amount of money, no. Uh, so in theory, uh, that 50 hours in 12 months, um, could cost you, um, I, I, you know, I don't know how you would cost it out. And if you did hire um, an external lobbyist, however, then they would have to report as registered lobbyists. So that might, so I suppose if you were going with a high priced lobbyist that could tip you into that. But I think for most small nonprofits, um, where you have, say, you know, you're an arts organization um, and you have three part-time staff um, employees or contractors, um, and maybe you sign on to um, a, a letter put out by the Alliance for Arts and Culture, um, you're, you're, you, don't need to, you don't need to register as a lobbyist. Um, but if you, if you are, uh, if you have eight staff, uh, and then you're automatically 
going to be included. You're not, you're no longer exempt or excluded. Um, and there I would argue, well, see what the role of a board member might be. And some of your board members are often the best advocates uh, for the work that you do, um, depending on the kind of organization that it is. And you may not be aware that, you know, how much time does the executive director uh, really have to devote to these activities, whatever you call them. So um, it might make sense um, in some instances for your board to get involved and for them to sign the letters um, and to own them too. I mean, it's not just about having them sign the letter. You won't, in my experience, very few directors will sign these sorts of letters without serious consideration because it's their name on, on the record, right? So I think, um, uh, so there's the long answer to your short question. Terry, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? So the question again was, is there any connection between, uh, or does the amount of time and money spent on lobbying affect whether the small not-for-profits qualify for reporting? No, I think Martha really covered it in terms of the technical aspects. That's really it, yeah. Okay. All right, so here's another question from Cheryl Rogers. Is there a connection between the LTA requirements and the CRA requirements? No. Sorry? No? You're about to jump in, Martha, with the no? That's no, great. yeah, no. No, there is no relationship. I think it's the use of the term political that still gets people confused. Obviously, when you're advocating for change in a policy and you are speaking to a policymaker, AKA an MLA, ipso facto, if that's the right one, um, you're, you're in. Um, that's where you, that's political. Arguably, advocacy is political. Um, what, what the CRA means by political is very specific partisan political activities. And by partisan, they mean vote NDP. We love NDP or liberal or Greens or Bloc Québécois, whatever that means to you. Um, that is partisan. Saying to uh, government uh, during an election, um, we need to address the affordability crisis in housing. Uh, all parties, please listen. That is political activities. And those are, um, those are and have been for a, quite a long time. If you ever read the T3010s of the Fraser Institute, because they apparently do no political they have no political activities and haven't had any political activities for a long time. It was, uh, you know, the poor environmental groups that were saying that they were engaging in political activities um, that were the ones that were audited and hence why we're, and, and together against poverty also. Um, so there was the partisanship, arguably not them, but the government of the day, shall we say. Um, and I would say even um, cool. because our organizations do have knowledge about what maybe should be done, uh, the example that Martha gave of pre during elections, preparing a, um, recommendations and then a checklist of what, which, what each party is doing compared to the checklist of what we think needs to be done you know on the environment or on um you know increasing funding for arts and culture that kind of um providing a checklist for each party is useful information and helps shape well can help shape their their platforms but there are private sector organizations that do things like after the office closes they run phone banks to elect a specific individual and i think that that is what government is thinking about when they think about partisan activity and the CRA. Like there are groups that are trying to put their people 
into office, which is something different than what Martha and you know has just described about influencing policy and platforms. Right. right. Which is also why trade unions, which are nonprofit organizations in most part of the country, are not exempt from lobbyist transparency act uh, or of similar legislation across the country. So while charities and nonprofits may be exempt, there is a further indication that this does not apply to the following types of organizations include, and they usually mention trade unions because like some other organizations, they do close the office and uh, um, and work phone banks. <laughs> Not all, and you might be surprised to learn that some of them are, are running phone banks for other than the NDP, incidentally, uh, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, let me ask you this, uh, and for some of the people who are not from BC who you know might be interested in a little bit of background about the Lobbyist and Transparency Act. Uh, there is this periodical, th this comes in waves where governments want to know more about charities and, and what charities are doing. And that happened after 9-11. It happened, you know, it's happened in different periods. You know, it comes up when we talk about FinTrack and about tracking you know, you know, tracking money laundering, and it comes up, it's even come up now with the Ukrainian situation in London, where a lot of, you know, money that flowed out of Russia and, you know, in suspect ways ended up with foundations and with some charities. Uh, do you think that, can, you, can all of you comment on the, this moment? Um, and, you know, why this conversation is sort of, has kind of bubbled to the surface in BC and elsewhere? Sarah, let's I'll start with you. Sure. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think because of, you know, nonprofits and charities are, are on the front lines doing work in community and have been seeing so much, particularly in these past two years with the pandemic and um, the, the climate disasters that we've experienced here in BC. And then you look at other places around the world and across the country and what they're experiencing too. Um, I think that our sector's voices need to be heard by government. And when there are barriers and legislative restrictions, um, yeah, creating challenges for them to speak up and share their voices. And oftentimes, you know, they're not going to be heard unless they've been invited to sit at a round table or, or something. And then again, you know, that round table is limited to, to X amount of people. And, and how does government choose who's going to be there? It's, it's um, yeah, I think that that is one of the reasons why particularly here in BC that the Lobbyist Transparency Act and, and organizations coming together to advocate for changes is happening. We're, we're recognizing that we're hearing so many things from a lot of organizations. I also think that having a parliamentary secretary, a, a home for, for this sector in government in BC is also, um, is al also helping this sector to advance changes and the changes we want to see. I think the fact that there was the update to P.S. Sharma's uh, mandate letter, including the LTA, I think that that, that to me shows that Government is also hearing these things and, and, and recognizing that perhaps some changes need to happen for our sector. Sherry, what do you think? I think the, what Sarah just described in terms of the sector coming together to collectively achieve things does feel like something new happening in BC uh, at, at this moment. And so that's sort of an exciting um, period. It also gives rise to the conversation about, well, what, what does the Lobbyist Transparency Act mean then as we're starting to mobilize. At the same time, John, the, the activities you described uh, to me are kind of abusive of the system, of the system right? There's, a, there's always a, an opportunity for corruption. And, and um, you know, especially organizations with less public interest mindedness and a lot of resources, the ability for them to create a charity or to create an organization through which to funnel sort of shady activities or shady political activities, of course that is there. And I think that 
those are the types of organizations that government is trying to keep an eye on. Right. But the chilling effect is that it's really the not-for-profits who are doing above board good work and don't have the resources to argue <laughs> all of these little details are the ones who are being sidelined. So I guess my takeaway from this discussion is that yes, each of us as small organizations um, may be limited by the number of staff and, and, and contractors we have in place, but together we actually have a lot of influence. You know, we, we employ 86,000 people in British Columbia. There are 29,000 societies registered. And the example that Sarah gave of how the sector came together and lobbied for a parliamentary secretary in government to be a home for the sector, that's just one example of how we can work together across the province and affect change so that we're not so isolated as small individual groups. I, all of which we can accomplish without having to register under the LTA is my argument. And the reality is, is that the money laundering situation that has arisen in this province and elsewhere, let's be honest, and matters like We Charity are the ones that are pushing for more transparency. I mean, look at the Societies Act when it changed in 2016. It was changed so that we would be more transparent. So now we have societies in, you know, I'm not going to name it, but we have a society that has been required by the Civil Resolution Tribunal to make available its accounting register records that means it's freaking gen general ledger to a member who doesn't even live in the community anymore because he has a bee, bee in his bloody bonnet and they have spent inordinate amounts of hours and had a lawyer through their insurer try to address this issue and get these uh, documents redacted to no avail. So the personal information of anybody donating and anybody working for that organization has basically been violated in service of accountability to one mad hatter, so to speak. And that is a situation that I see every week. And I think that the necessary accountability has always been there. We Charity is an outlier. And even then, I'm not convinced that what they did was illegal or criminal. What they did was a problem for governance. It was a problem for how they did it. But, you know, there's more and more emphasis. Good Lord, the government is pouring money into so-called social enterprise. We even have a B Corp Act in this province, which is just pure and simple, you know, whitewashing, greenwashing, whatever you want to call it. What a load of claptrap. And yet that's what we're funding instead of ensuring that the sector that needs to feed people in the poorest postal code in the bloody country has access to doing so without having to register 16 members of the staff as lobbyists and then report on it. The fact that the Canadian Cancer Society has to report on this stuff is a, is objectionable in the extreme and I don't understand like I get why we want to have a you know be incremental and I I'm and that's you know but me personally not my organization but me personally this is bloody offensive and if we really care about civil society and democracy then we and we want accountability then let's look to the nefarious actors largely in the corporate sector who are doing this, not at, um, you know, the Canadian Cancer Society or PLEO or, you know, the Alliance for Arts and Culture. Good Lord, what a waste of everybody's time and energy. End of rant. That was advocacy. Uh, so uh, let me just close with one quick question for all three of the panelists. And I think we've run out of questions on the chat. Um, so we managed to get uh, uh, 56 minutes into this conversation without ever talking about technology and social media. And just as a going forward comment, I'm, I'm curious to get all of you to say one or two quick things about whether the, whether the information environment that we're in, how that plays in these considerations, because there are so many more ways of getting a message across um, that reach policymakers in very specific ways that 
you know, don't have anything to do with, you know, with lobbyist registrations or conventional lobbying techniques. So um, let, let me, uh, let me begin with Sarah. What do you think? Yeah, that's like a really good question. I know um, in, in the current Lobbyist Transparency Act that um, organizations and, and registrants have to report um, to the ORL on any um, social media communication that is directed to um, public officers, to elected officials. And um, one of the recommendations in our brief is, is to remove that reporting requirement because social media posting on social media is already public record you know like the, the when you think about the main purpose of registering lobbying and the lobbyist transparency act is is to be transparent of your lobbying activity but if you're already doing that on social media which is a public platform there, there it's already transparent and so um, it's it's one requirement that doesn't need to be reported, shouldn't be reported, but is actually a part of the Lobbyist Transparency Act. Okay, that's a that's a good uh, point, uh, Sherry. What do you think? I mean, I agree, and I think that this is a a new kind of horizon that's opening up because uh, each organization's uh, list of followers is different. So it's possible to influence a decision maker without actually tagging them in the post. Um, you know, it, 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 I agree with Sarah, it shouldn't be in the act because it's messy. And, and it also, the environment you've described where there are ways of influencing decision makers without meeting with them directly or sending them a letter. Yeah, this is a whole new can of worms and uh, one that we, you know, are still exploring. Right. And I, I'm, hence why my comment is whose transparency is it anyway? We are the most transparent, if you ask me, of the, of the subsectors in the economy, good God. And it just astounds me. We have, we have to write reports to funders. We have accountability to our communities. We have accountability uh, all over the place. Um, it's the unaccountable that they should be directing their attention to. And goodness knows, there are precious few resources for all of this. Like, since when is making the, uh, the lobbyist registry into this huge document for every, I mean, that in and of itself is spending resources that we arguably don't have. We need to be addressing the urgent crises in our current moment, which include things like lit and rebuilding, including um, all of the places that were flooded, all of the other issues that we need to be addressing, hunger, poverty, homelessness, and all of that requires limited funding. And may, might I also say resources to support a provincially governed, set of legal clinics so that everybody has access, meaningful access to justice. That's what we need to be spending resources on, not forcing the, the, the staff at the Canadian Cancer Society to hire somebody to actually, you know, manage how many times they speak to a plethora of um, office holders. It just makes no sense to me that that is that that seems to be the way we're going and social media you know good it's just an endless way to make work for people who actually could be doing other things great i think that that's a good place to wrap up uh, we we went an hour and uh, so i'd like to thank uh, martha and sherry and sarah um, for their really int interesting and insightful comments and to everyone who attended for attending and I hope you take away some uh, insights that you can share with your own organizations. Wonderful and thanks so much for making the time John to moderate and uh, Sarah and Sheree um, please know how much we appreciate your willingness to enter into this conversation today. Thanks everyone for joining us and please get in touch if you are looking for more information uh, and we'll try and help. Have a great afternoon, rainy though it may be here in BC.